Buonasera a tutti gli amici di, di Facebook. Good evening uh, to all our Facebook friends. Uh, here we are. It's uh, 8.30 Italian time. And uh, uh, here we are with Elizabeth Howard. She's going to tell us a very interesting story, her life story and the story that is behind her uh, vocal power method. So we would like to, you know, we would like you to start from the very beginning when you were a child and, you know, how you you came in contact with music and how you started loving it. Yes. Okay. First of all, I was born <laughs> in Manhattan, uh, May 15th, 1941. So I am in less than a year, I'm going to be 80. Ha! <laughs> And, um, but I've stopped at 40, so that's where I'm really at. So uh, my parents were both Italian. Um, my father actually born in Palermo, uh, Joseph Pandolfini. And uh, my mother's parents were born uh, in Pisiquino outside of Palermo and their last name was Lanza. So my original name, um, Sonanata Elizabeth, Pandolfini, but, but during the years uh, becoming a professional actress singer, I changed my name to be more American. And um, it was easier to pronounce and I did, didn't have trouble being typecast, which is um, if you have an ethnic last name, you, they tend to cast you in ethnic roles. But I didn't want to be categorized i wanted to be able to be free to sing and act roles that i was right for so anyway i was about five years old or let's say i was three when my parents divorced divorzata and uh i had my mother uh solo and solamente mia madre e, e dio uh insieme uh, dur durante the World War, uh, Guerra, uh, World War II, and my mother went to work for the armaments for designing submarines and the motors underneath the submarines. And my father went to Detroit to work in the ammunition plant. M meanwhile, both of them were artists. My mother was an actress by the time she was 18, 19 on Broadway. But all of that had to stop when the World War II started. My father was an artist, a painter. In fact, he is in um, America's Who's Who in American Art, Joseph Pandolfini, who is well known in the 30s. Um, so I came from two artists, really. Uh, my mother remarried when I was about five or six years old. And uh, he was another artist. He played violin and his his career was interior design. It's very artistic. He sculpted, he painted. And my mother was also a dancer. So she opened up a dance studio and uh, later added music. But when I was five, going back to that age, um, I was lucky to get some piano lessons. I started my piano lessons at five years old. And my teacher uh, in the recitals, instead of playing a piece to look at, to, to uh, read uh, music, my teacher would let me improvise. And I would improvise in the style of Bach. So I was five years old and I was playing what I thought was Bach. So I've always had a love for Bach and uh, classical music. So my mother remarried, um, as I said, was about six years old. And all this time we're struggling, you know, because during the war, nobody had anything. And we struggled even more during the second marriage because they started from nothing. And we lived behind the store in one room my parents, myself, and then my brother was born when I was eight years old. And there were four of us uh, behind the, the store. It was interior decorating. So in the front of the store were all these fancy furniture, lamps, and 
sculptures. And in the back, we had two beds that used to fold out from the wall. But I had my piano. My father was a violinist. My stepfather was a violinist and he also played piano and he wanted me to have a piano. And he wanted me also to study um, a stringed instrument in the fifth grade. In the fifth grade in school, they started an orchestra. It was an experimental program. So I took the cello, which was very big for a 10 year old, tiny little girl. But he wanted to play violin and meet cello and we could do duets, so he said. So I started cello from the age of 10 all the way through high school and I played in the orchestra. Um, meanwhile, my dance, my dancing was the most important thing to me from age five or six. Uh, my uncle had a ballet school and I went to his school and I was on point on toe shoes by the age of eight or nine, which is very young. They don't advise to do that, you know, but uh, back then we, we did. And I went, um, I, got, I got pretty good and my mother thought I was ready for a scholarship at Carnegie Hall in a ballet studio in New York City. So she took me there and I auditioned and I had a free ballet scholarship for three years till I was 15. And then we reevaluated. And you know, for ballet, you need to be a certain height, you need long neck, you need beautiful thin legs, which I didn't have. I loved to dance, it was my first love. Um, when I was 15, around that time, I switched to singing. And the turning point came when my mother found a music camp for me. They were starting a dance, comp a dance division. And they had a well-known dance teacher there. And I went up and I got a scholarship in dance for the summer. Well, the first day of camp, the director said, if anybody would like to take singing lessons, we have a teacher here on her summer vacation, Miss Stone. And I looked over and I thought, ooh, that sounds like a good idea. My father, the violinist, my stepfather, had always played Metropolitan Opera broadcasts every Saturday afternoon. And I was very influenced by that music and the singing. And once in a while, I would just imitate at I was like 10, 11, 12. <laughs> and my father one day said to me, listen, he said, if by 18 years old, if you can sing, if you if you can sing like that, he said, I'm going to send you to Italy to study. <laughs> and I never forgot that. So that summer I took lessons and by the end of the summer I sang uh with the, the concert band. It was a concert band. That's another story, too, because I played cello and the director said to me, well, bring your cello. We don't have a string. We don't have strings. We're all woodwinds and brass. But you can sit next to the euphonium player and play your cello. So I did. I took my cello and I played <laughs> off the, the stand of the euphonium player. I took my voice lessons and I had no idea that it was it was difficult to sing Il Bacio, which is a classical piece with lots of coloratura. Coloratura meaning, ah, hey, ah, you know, very quick notes. And it was easy for me, I guess, because I played piano and cello and I could hear the notes. And what I could hear, I could sing. And they, um, I practiced and they, they asked me to sing with the, with the concert band on the radio at the end of the summer. So I sang with the with concert band. Meanwhile, and that was great. I mean, that was a great experience. And from that experience, I, I said, when I get back to New York, I'm going to try to get into the chorus in high school, in my high school chorus. Meanwhile, at the same time, I was a dance major, I mean, at the camp. And we the whole camp took a trip up to Montreal, Canada, and we stayed in different people's homes for a week and we performed at night. And they had me doing flamenco with castanets and the whole thing with heel work. And I, it was Espana Cañi was the name of the band piece. And when we got there, I had rehearsed it very well. When we got there though, the people said, we are all prepared for your dance. Look at the stage we built you. The stage was about, 
like a first floor of a of a building, no fence, all open, with stairs going up about twenty venti stairs going up. And I looked, and I have fear of heights, but I did the dance, and I went very very slowly up the stairs at the beginning of it, and I improvised the whole dance because there were the platform was tiny. I couldn't wow. do turns. I couldn't do any, any of my choreography. So I basically had to stay in one place and dance. So that, that was a, an interesting experience. So there I am, a dance major, but really my heart started to fall in love with singing, being a singer. So when I got back, I went to the director of, of my orchestra where I played in high school. And I said, you've seen me dance. You've heard me sing. You've see me play cello what do you think i should do and he said i think your your talent lies in singing and i know of a good teacher for you and he gave me her name i went to see her again i got a little scholarship to 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 work with her husband was a teacher at the juilliard school of music and one day he came into the room he said i've been listening to your lessons he said i want you to audition for juilliard and I said, really? And he said, yes, I would like that. I said, uh, well, I would love to do that. So after two years, um, my senior year in high school, I gave, a, I gave a full recital, classical recital. And I, uh, I had applied to Juilliard. I got in. And um, in fact, I got into Juilliard, Manis, and Manhattan School of Music, the three well-known in Manhattan schools of music, but I didn't get into the regular colleges <laughs> because I had spent all my time practicing my music and not that much time on academics. So, but the irony is six years later, I was teaching at one of those schools <laughs> that I didn't get into. So I went to Juilliard and um, I was going to study with uh, my teacher's husband, but he went into the hospital that year and I ended up with a different teacher. By the end of that year, I had vocal problems. She was not the teacher I hoped that she would be. And my jaw was shaking when I said, and my throat, I was tight. So I changed teachers to my roommate's teacher. But I tell you, after two, three years, I got better, but not that much better. By the end of Juilliard, I, um, I could sing a couple of days and then I'd be hoarse a couple of days. Then I could sing a couple of days really well enough to do a recital or a recording and then I'd be hoarse. And I knew something was really wrong. At the same time, I was up for a Fulbright scholarship that a, from a tape in a recording studio, an audition tape that I made and they brought me into the finals. Wouldn't you know, a week before the finals, I got sick. I couldn't sing. I got throat. It was all nerves, I'm sure. And that didn't happen for me, that Fulbright, which I really wanted to go to Italy or Germany or some abroad to study. But I did get into Indiana University as a graduate assistantship to teach for a year. And that's where I went after Juilliard. I went to um, Indiana and I did teach and I did take voice lessons. But again, the teacher there, she was all about herself and her new marriage and her new husband. She talked the whole time about herself and I didn't get anywhere. So I left IU, Indiana University, and went back to Juilliard to get my master's, thinking, well, maybe my teacher can help me. But she wasn't able to help me either. So I went to a teacher on the outside of Juilliard and I had two teachers, which I do not recommend having two teachers at the same time very confusing mm -hmm. and um i spent a year and a half working on my master's degree which i did get i had to have 32 pieces ready all classical ready from memory for my master's degree which somehow i was able to do at the same time i was teaching at hunter college i got a job at hunter college in new york city teaching voice class teaching singing. And I'm saying to myself, I'm having so much trouble with my own voice. Why am I teaching singing? 
it was really tough, but somehow the, the students did really well. They sang very well. I have a very good ear and I could correct them without giving them real technique. You know, I, I gave them what I was taught, which was a problem. So, which I, when I got out of the masters and completed that, I was basically ready to give up singing. I really, I really, I had nothing else that I could do. I, I couldn't even get a sales job at a department store. So I was really in a very confused state. I went to a few teachers, voice teachers that were recommended, about 15, I counted 15 teachers within about six months. None of them had any answers for me. A couple of them had um, things that I still use, but what, what happened is, um, my then husband, I had gotten married at 25 years old to someone I knew in high school. We were very good friends. And he was a wonderful singer and he, he was self-taught. He learned how to, to sing on his own. He sounded a lot like Mario Lanza. That's, yeah. that, that was beautiful, his singing was that beautiful. In fact, he's on my tapes on the, um, the Born to Sing video. That's Howard Austin. And, um, one night we were lying uh, in bed and I was crying about my singing. And he said, listen, he said, why don't you just sing a note? No, don't sing with any vibrato and just sing a note, straight tongue. So I was lying there and um, I went, ah, and he, he took his hand and right, right here where my solar plexus is, he did little pulses. So it came out instead of, Ah, it came ah, and I heard a vibrato for the first time without any tension in my throat, without any tension in my throat. I, I jumped out of bed at two in the morning. I said, let's go to the piano. And that was the beginning of my finding out step by step how to, how breathing, how to breathe, how to support how to sustain a tone. So I was working on my voice and I was teaching at Hunter and I had quite a few private students by then. I left Hunter after two years and I moved up to the West, I was on the West side on 75th street, but I moved up to West End and 96th street where I stayed for about 10 years. And I improved my own voice. I improved my teaching method and I started getting students from Broadway um, I got a 17, 18 year old girl just up from Florida, wanted to learn. And um, I spent two, two years with her. And years later, she tells me you were my only teacher. And her name is Paige O'Hara. And she's the voice of Belle in the movie, Beauty and the Beast. So I taught a lot of Broadway people from Chorus Line, um, Godspell, Jesus Christ Superstar, Follies. Uh, I can't even remember all of all of the the shows they were in. Um, but and I was singing and and acting in New York at the same time. There were times when I would go to the same audition as a student, <laughs> and we would see each other there. It was <laughs> quite interesting and a lot of fun. And I met a lot of a lot of people in New York. Um, I was in a show called Blood with uh produced by joseph papp the new york shakespeare festival company it was a six-month workshop 17 singers and actresses gathered from all over the country to write this musical at the end of the six week the six months six days a week i realized i had some kind of talent in songwriting so i quit I quit the, the business uh, for a while to take some time off to see if I could actually write some songs. My then husband, Howard Austin, was terrific with lyrics and poetry. And together, we combined a team and we called ourselves Cain and Glory. We put a band together and we were signed by MCA Music. Um, music publishing company, the same company, Elton John. Um, it was a very big company. We were signed 
And we were in and out of the recording studios doing our demos of new songs. That went on for, you know, a year maybe. And then I got the itch to go to California. And I left everything. I left my students, I left my songwriting contract, and I moved to Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, I taught mostly film and TV people. And I established myself pretty, pretty quickly in the first few months. And meanwhile, the vocal power method was developing. Uh, and I really had a method. And uh, for example, the mix that we all talk about that extends the chest voice, you know, from the lower notes, whoa, that kind of sound. Well, I learned it from listening to a, a black singer named by the name of Melba Moore. She was very, very popular in the, I guess it was the 70s. And I had developed that when I was in New York because I had students coming to me asking me to sing like Barbara Streisand, for example. And I hadn't, I didn't have a clue because I was a classical singer, but little by little, I put everything together and I created a step-by-step -step system of teaching people how to sing in any genre. Because as a 12 year old, when I was, I forgot to tell you this, I was writing songs rock and roll songs. I was listening to rock and roll music. That's in the 50s. So I always loved all kinds of music, always embraced blues to jazz, to pop, to rock, to classical, to music theater, all of it. And um, because I love it, and I think a teacher should, a good teacher really should inform themselves of all this music and understand what the beauty in each genre is what is the attraction? Why do people love to listen to Rihanna? What, what is it in her voice? What is in the voice of Elton John and Sting and Lionel Richie? What, what, what is the beauty? What are people attracted to? And when you realize and analyze what it is, then only then can you embrace it, love it yourself and teach it with love and with information and technique. The technique is very important, very important. The technique starting with breathing and support. While I was in Los Angeles, I had some interesting experiences. One of them was um, <laughs> I got a call saying, we need a coach for a singer at the Grammy Awards tonight down at Staples Center. Well, Staples Center is a sports arena. And I, I knew there wouldn't be a piano there so I had my little electric piano, two octaves. I said, well, I'll bring my electric piano. They said, okay, by the way, the singer is Sting. I said, Sting? And I had just been listening to all of his albums that whole year, in my blasting in my office. I said, really? Said, yes, He's, they're going to open, they're kicking off their reunion tour, this Sting, the police. In 2007, this was. So they're wow. in the Grammys. They're opening the show with Roxanne. I said, with Roxanne? He said, yes, and he needs a warm-up coach. So I went down there with my little piano, and I entered the dressing room, and Sting was sitting there on a very high chair getting his makeup and his hair put on. And we chatted, and I told him I thought he was the Shakespeare of pop, and he loved that. <laughs> Classical album. I said, yes, I just got it. I love it. We chatted and then we started doing some exercises. And he said, you know, in a hotel room, I had my high C. I need a high C for this. I said, well, I got my piano. Let's go for it. So I gave him some exercises. He stood up and he was still putting his boots on and his shirt and his white shirt, his outfit and singing and breathing. And I told him a few things what to do. We got all the way up to an E above high C. I said, well, you're going to be fine because you just vocalized to an E flat E above the high C. So you're going to be great. You're going to be, just don't worry about anything. it will be terrific. He, so he said, thank me very much. And the show went on. He was great. Uh, the police did a bang up job. They were wonderful. 
the following um, week, I got a call from his manager to ask me if I could go to the homes of the two uh, instrumentalists in the police, the um, Stuart, uh, the drummer, and um, Andy, the uh, guitarist, and teach the work with their voices. So I worked about nine hours each of them before they went on tour because they wanted them to sing. The management wanted them to sing with as backup to sing, to sting. So that was a very wonderful experience. Um, another experience I had was Priscilla Presley came to me for lessons. And um, she, her first lesson, uh, she said, you know, I've, I have all this music I've been exposed to for so many years. I feel there's a voice inside of me. I said, there's a, there's a voice inside of everybody that anyone can sing given the proper tools. She said, okay, I'd like to try. I said, and you know, by the way, I want you to know, I mean, I know, you know, you're Priscilla Presley, but I wasn't really a big fan of, of Elvis. I, I mean, in those years, I was mostly listening to classical singing and music. She said, oh, how refreshing. <laughs> because I guess people are just yeah. after her because of him. So we worked about a year and a half, two, three times a week. And we went into the recording studio and she did record. And the recording was supposed to be for Europe. But when we went to the B side, the other side, she got the movie um, Naked Gun and she had to leave the whole project, which I was very disappointed because she was singing very well. Anyway, that was that experience. And um, another um, interesting one was with Lionel Richie. I got a call oh. from their, man their management asking me to, to go to his place, his, uh, his studio and work with him. So I went with, and he, then he asked me to work with his daughter. So I worked with his daughter as well. So that was um, that was about a whole summer worth. And he was getting his voice back after some surgery and he sounded great. He was just wonderful. And he, a wonderful person. I played on the piano. He said, you're playing on the piano that I composed all my hits on. I said, oh, okay. Wow. All right, this is wonderful. And that was a, a great experience. And I've had a lot of, you know, terrific teaching experiences, uh, whether they were a celebrity or a beginner, didn't matter to me because if someone loved music and loved to sing, that was the important, that was most important to me. And especially I loved building voices. I was pretty good at that, you know, taking someone that just barely could sing and getting them to a professional level within two years. Um, I've had students um, come to me in high school and graduate from Juilliard, several from Juilliard, several from Manhattan School of Music, from Berkeley College of Jazz, uh, the New School, Manus, where else? Oberlin, USC, UCLA, and um, all doing doing very well. Right now, of course, with the virus, we're you know on hold. Yeah. But I tell everybody, this is the perfect time to woodshed and work on your singing work on your voice, you know, get perfect, expand, got, do what you have, get what you have and uh, go for it, you know. I have two students right now, one is coming out of Yale and one is going into it and they're gonna be meeting up the next, next year. Um, lovely girls, beautiful girls, beautiful voices. Um, I forgot to mention I was hired at Pepperdine University. I, I didn't apply for the job. But the director of the music department contacted me and he said, can I have a meeting with you? He came to my studio and he sat there and he listened to some of my students. He said, I'm, I'm coming here because we need desperately a, sing, a teacher to teach non-classical voice, belting, basically, because we do shows like Evita, A Man of La Mancha, and our our girl singers need, need to be able to sing um, with their belt the ha 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 that kind of sound you know where whereas um the teachers on the staff were all classically trained so i spent 15 years one or two times a week as an adjunct professor teaching at pepperdine university what launched my career really worldwide was my workshops and master classes 
I had, uh, I was a member of the National Association of Teachers of Singing from about 1980, um, a little later when I got to Los Angeles and I became, uh, I went to all the meetings. So I really loved the teachers and I loved being there and I became a uh, publicity director for two years and then two years um, vice president in charge of programming and the final two years uh, president, they made me president in 2000, year 2000. And meanwhile, I was doing workshops for different chapters of Nats in San Francisco, San Diego, Los Angeles, and uh, re the regional Nats, uh, the Western region. And then I was asked to do the national, National Association of Teachers of Singing, the national convention in Philadelphia in year 2000 which I did, and they gave me three hours, which is like unheard of anymore. Nobody gets more than 40 minutes. But they gave me from nine to 12 on a Saturday. And there were teachers and directors of music departments from all over the world. And out of that workshop and masterclass that I worked with a few singers at the end of the, the workshop on their songs, I got several countries to come to, to do my presentation um, in uh, for their national conventions. So I've been to 11 countries for their national conventions, working with singers and giving my workshops for, um, for singers, for teachers organizations. And let me say, at that 2000 Philadelphia National Association of Teachers of Singing Convention is when I met my dearest friend, Anna Gotti. And she, we sat down and we said we would make arrangements. And I came to Italy the year after for Echi and for Brescia for doing workshops for the singers in Brescia and um, singers and teach singers who wanted to be vocal power certified. So we created a certification where you got it, you took a test, you took the training. You took the exam and you got a certificate from the Vocal Power Academy in Los Angeles. I am happy to say that Ava was one of the first six yeah. that we <laughs> gave exams to. And now we have over 60, close to 70 uh, throughout Italy, including Sardinia and, and Sicily, all throughout Rome, Roma, Firenze. I won't mention everybody. Oh, if I try to mention everyone, don't let I don't want to leave anyone out, so I won't say anything. But we, throughout Italy, we have over 60 teachers teaching the vocal power method. At this age, I, um, um, I'm not teaching very much um, in virtual, a few, just a few students. But I really want to still help singers and teachers with, with their voices. Um, in 1980, when I arrived at Los, in Los Angeles, I decided to give a course and it was a 12 week course. And the course turned out to be my the outline of my first my first book, Sing, it was called Sing in a little black cover with one tiny plastic cassette. <laughs> it grew to this behind me, Sing, uh, with four CDs. And then I pr we produced um, the Born to Sing video. Or to sing video, or, and then I created uh, a book called the ABCs of Vocal Harmony. It's right here. Oh, this way. ABC. Yes. That's and that's for singers to develop their ear and their sight singing and their ear training, and that comes with four CDs, with scales, chords, intervals, rhythms everything I thought a singer needed to be a good musician. And wouldn't you know, Alfred Publishing picked it up and they distributed my products worldwide. And Ava translated, sing. Oh, in yeah. Italian. That's true. And That's true. Volante Publishers picked it up and are, it's distributed throughout Italy. I Italia. Yes. So, Sono felice, molto, eh, 
I, I would it. like to invite somebody here with us. Okay. Could I invite? I, I know what it is. I would love to invite my dearest friend and colleague for the last 19, 20 years who has been my, without this person, vocal power would not exist, non esiste, in uh, Italia. And here she is to join us. <laughs> The director, the director, she's hot. She's a hottie, I'll tell you. Very hot. Yes. <laughs> here uh, from Brescia, and she is the director of Vocal Power Italia, Academia Vocal Power, uh, throughout Italia. And um, hello, Anna, to join us. Hello, hello. I've been listening to you, your wonderful story. I I know it so well, but listening to you all the time, it so uh, it opens up my heart. Devo parlare italiano o in inglese? Uh, beh, essendo 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 diciamo eh, la responsabile di Vocal Power Italia, direi che uh, forse uh, l'italiano so there's no problem if Anna is speaking Italian because you understand Liz so I guess it might be better for Anna to to be speaking in Italian because uh, that's you know may, maybe singers or uh, Italian teachers might be listening so it might be easier Hello, dearest Liz. Ciao a tutti. Grazie a Eva Simontacchi per aver avuto questa bellissima idea di presentare Liz e poi fare la sorpresa anche a me, invitare anche me. Allora, io ehm, ha già detto molto Liz. Io ripeto soltanto che questa donna la conosco oramai da 20 anni e, e quando l'ho conosciuta era al Philadelphia National Convention dell'associazione um, dell eh, americana degli insegnanti di canto. Io allora ero vicepresidente della nostra associazione in Italia ed ero andata lì con il presidente eh, Massimo Sardi e con la logopedista Anna Colombo. Eravamo stati invitati e siamo andati a assistere. Io ho visto questa piccola donna seduta al pianoforte, aveva il vestitino per vinca blu a questo pianoforte di coda bellissimo e ci saranno stati almeno almeno 500 insegnanti seduti nell'auditorium dell'albergo e io mi sono messa in fondo ero quasi sai un pochettino un po' vergognosa no ho detto oh, questa grande donna sentiamo e mi sono messa lì in fondo e dentro di me dicevo ma io questo però lo faccio anch'io, ma questo lo faccio anch'io, ma guarda allora si vede che sono diventata una brava insegnante anch'io, <ride> E allora alla fine ci siamo, lei ha voluto conoscermi perché sapeva che c'era una rappresentante italiana, io non vedevo l'ora di conoscerla e abbiamo parlato un po', abbiamo detto a me piacerebbe, lei mi diceva Eh, piacerebbe molto venire in Italia e io ho detto magari ho detto sai noi siamo un'associazione i primi passi però in qualche modo mi era rimasta qui questa cosa sono tornata a casa ho guardato tutti i miei libri ma così e ho trovato il suo primo libro tutto segnato da me che io lo avevo da tanti tanti anni ed era per quello che tante cose le conoscevo perché già le facevo siccome io studiavo tutti i libri che mi capitavano per mano allora allora questa cosa qui è stata veramente molto molto interessante le ho scritto subito avevo un computer ma sai nel 99 2000 il computer no avevo il mac di mio marito giù nello studio a dire il vero Scritto e gli faccio, <coughs> io ti devo portare in Italia, ho detto, adesso fammi pensare anche con l'associazione, vediamo come possiamo fare. Io sono stata invitata a cantare nel 2001 al Festival Jazz di Brescia e con l'organizzatrice, che adesso purtroppo non c'è più, una persona veramente molto, molto di grande cuore, ehm, 
mi fa, eh, sai che cosa facciamo? Facciamo venire, a, facciamo anche il seminario. E così è successo, ma è una cosa così velocissima, con l'AICI siamo riusciti ad organizzarlo. Io ho organizzato tutto con questa Daniela Fantoni eh, qui a Brescia, abbiamo trovato un teatro bellissimo. Mi ricordo che la nostra prima traduttrice era la Luttazzi, Donatella Luttazzi, che è stata bravissima. E io dovevo presentare Lizza, adesso vi faccio ridere, molti di voi magari la sanno già, dovevo ero talmente agitata, talmente emozionata, né Liz, ricordo questo, che io faccio, e adesso sono felice di potervi presentare una grande donna, dopo che ho letto tutto il curriculum, Elizabeth Taylor. Ma... Benvenuti. Così, e lei non saliva, perché lei non capiva cosa stava succedendo. Io dicevo, sì, Elizabeth Taylor, e la Luttazzi mi faceva, Anna, non si chiama Elizabeth Taylor, si chiama Elizabeth Tower. Oddio! <ride> è stata una cosa, ce ne, siamo, ne abbiamo tante da raccontare, perché dopo, è logico che dopo eh, grande, questo grande incontro, anche con l'AICI, l'abbiamo portata in Italia parecchie volte a fare seminari, poi abbiamo incominciato una collaborazione perché... Eh, c'erano tanti insegnanti mi ricordo che una eh, eri tu eh, che volevano conoscere questo metodo e volevano certificarsi nel metodo allora con Liz ho detto cosa facciamo eh, cominciamo e allora abbiamo incominciato e mi ricordo che il primo gruppo adesso non vorrei sbagliarmi ma forse mi ricordo tutti i nomi il primo gruppo era Vai. Eh? Vai. Vediamo. io me li ricordo dillo sì, allora, Eva Simontacchi, Susi Dal Gesso, sì. Brunella Mazzola qui a Brescia, sì. Eva Carboni, aspetta, eh, poi, ah, oddio, ah, Bolzano, Bertoldi, Bolzano, Bertoldi e la Madì, la Alessandra Madì, Roma, Roma. E Roma. Enrico, Enrico no, D'Amore, no, no, no. no, dopo è venuto Enrico. Eh, chi manca? Anche? So, ok. Sto no, ce n'è un'altra. Ce n'è un'altra. La Brava, quella di Milano che poi si è ritirata lei perché non insegna più. Ed era molto brava anche lei. E quindi no, erano anche sette. Io la prima volta cioè, dovevo preparare sette persone per me era un casino, scusate la parola. Però... Alla fine ce l'avete fatta tutti. Da lì poi eh, ogni anno, ah ma vorrei farlo anch'io, vorrei farlo anch'io, allora è cominciato poi la collaborazione ed è nata nel 2007 la Vocal Power, eh, l'Accademia Vocal Power Italia a Brescia proprio per organizzare tutte queste cose perché se no da sola io non ce la facevo, era impossibile. Que ah no, la Scarinzi, ecco Stefania. Ah, Scarinzi, è a Firenze. Era era l'altra di Firenze. E credo di avervi detto tutti i nomi. Se per caso non ho detto tutti i nomi, scrivete in diretta a Eva Simontati che me lo dice subito. Ma qui, qui stanno scrivendo tutti. Eh, sì. Ciao Liz, ciao Anna. Eh, vi stanno tutte mandando lots of love. Eh, qualcuno <ride> ha scritto belle queste iniziative per dar vita alla musica, Fabrizio Zuccotti. Comunque Elisabetta Tulli ha mandato un cuore, comunque ce le... però le vedrete, le vedrete sotto al live, ovviamente adesso siamo su una piattaforma e vedo solo io diciamo, le cose che hanno scritto eh. e oltretutto non, non posso neanche rispondere, eh, ah. però non posso rispondere adesso, potrò rispondere eh. poi... Dal, da Facebook, certo, certo. certo. Non dimentico uh, your, your winners of the, of your, of the contest. The ah, sì, ah, certo, certo. Dopo io, eh, sì, l'anno scorso eh, lì è venuta per fare un seminario, eravamo anche, l'ha fatto a Brescia e poi siamo andati anche 
a Pescara da Alessandra De Luca che l'ha organizzato lei insieme a Vincenzo Di Nicola Antonio che è un altro insegnante lì. E noi due eravamo in albergo a dormire e chi passa a The Voice? Brenda Carolina Lawrence che era arrivata eh, nella semifinale che se andava bene quella sera sarebbe passata in finale. E di fatti io e lì sembravamo due teenagers nel letto che stavamo guardandola e poi è passata, è andata, è, è andata, è arrivata seconda lei. Io ero lì presente, ho visto tutto lo spettacolo e poi un'altra mia allieva che, che qui eh, la, la conosco dall'età di nove anni, però dieci anni, è quella che ha vinto questo caro quest'anno. Uh, a settembre, sì, settembre c'era Castro Caro, sono stata invitata dalla sua famiglia, siamo andati giù e dal nulla questa piccola grande donna a 22 anni, boom, bam, ha buttato fuori tutti, è arrivata prima e non ce l'aspettavamo neanche perché non aveva un, un brano inedito, era edito il brano che faceva lei e gli altri tutti avevano già un inedito. Però era talmente forte la personalità. E lì io le ho insegnato tante cose che Liz mi aveva insegnato su comportamento eh, del palcoscenico. E le risate che abbiamo fatto quando le avevo insegnate queste cose, appunto dicendo Liz dice questo, dice di fare così, di fare così. E, sì, loro due, loro sono... sono eh, I miei allievi sono tutti importanti, come dice anche Liz, non ce n'è uno meno, uno di più. Però quando arrivano questi, queste, queste belle sorprese, questi, vedi che questi ragazzi prendono una strada... Eh, vedi la, la gioia nelle loro, nei loro visi, la faccia e ringiovanisci anche tu cioè, e, e io vivo dalla loro gioia no? in quel momento sono così felici che ti danno tutto questo è molto, è molto bello anche quello che diceva Liz che eh, insegnare la tecnica è importantissima ma è l'amore per quello che facciamo alla base è quello, se non c'è amore non, non, non si può essere delle brave insegnanti. No, per l'amor del cielo, sono magari tecnicamente sono bravissime, però ci vuole il cuore, ci vuole il cuore per arrivare al cuore di altri cantanti. Eh, sono convinta di questo. E è stata un'esperienza con lei, a parte che noi siamo grandi amiche adesso, dopo tanti anni. E quando l'ho conosciuta lei... Questo non so se si ricorda che gliel'avevo detto. Mia mamma era morta da tre mesi ed era una piccola donna come lei. E quando l'ho conosciuta, cioè, eh, è stata una cosa veramente molto forte per me. Perché era un periodo molto triste, ma lei mi ha dato una gioia dentro, una carica. Perché questa donna, per l'età che ha, sembra una ragazzina di di 15 anni, cioè, ma neanche una ragazzina di 15 anni ha un'energia così. <ride> Quindi noi adesso con questo periodo della Covid che abbiamo avuto molto triste, lei tutte le settimane eravamo a parlarci insieme perché doveva essere qui da noi a maggio, come sempre, ogni anno, però anche quest'anno, eh, per quest'anno, per quello che è successo, non ha potuto venire. E quindi lei era molto preoccupata per me, per tutta la famiglia, per tutti noi, tutti gli insegnanti, come state, cosa sta succedendo. E devo dire che eh, ci è rimasta molto vicino e poi è successo da lei, quindi io sono rimasto vicino a lei. Poi, niente, così... Eh, non so che cosa vuoi che racconti, Eva, perché io e Liz insieme siamo pericolose se incominciamo a parlare. Eh, <ride> guarda, io sono stata molto zitta, anche perché se interrompevo le voci si accavallano e per fare riuscire bene un live bisogna proprio fare a turni bene bene. Eh, mm. Ma... Eh, non lo so, avete, avete ancora un pochino di autonomia, direi, per cui eh, non so se vuoi 
far parlare ancora Liz o vuoi dire ancora qualcosa tu? Ma, guarda, vorrei solo dire che questo metodo di Liz è stato veramente rivoluzionario per tutti quelli che lo hanno, ehm, lo hanno praticato su di sé e anche lo stanno insegnando. È per me che lo insegno da vent'anni, eh, io eh, ogni volta che lo insegno trovo qualche cosa di, che, mi, che insegna a me, qualche cosa che dico, ma guarda, anche questo, questo ci ha pensato anche a questo. Quindi è un, ehm, questo è veramente un, un metodo, Liz. L'ha fatto proprio passo per passo, pensando al problema che ha avuto lei con la voce, eh, e io quando l'avevo conosciuto nel 90, così, anch'io avevo appena passato un problema con la voce, perché facevo la media di 250 serate all'anno in giro per il mondo, ed ero, ero deficiente, non era normale, però sai quando hai un'agenzia, vai. E questo metodo mi ha, ti dà un, una strada da percorrere, no? Cioè ognuno di noi è diverso come insegnante, logicamente, e come cantante, però questo ha dei punti che accomuna proprio la tua voce al tuo stile. Mi sono spiegata? <ride> Ed è per quello che credo che la richiesta sia veramente tanta per questo. Eh, Quest'anno dobbiamo eh, certificare altri sette insegnanti. Sette sono tantissimi per noi, per, perché la nostra accademia è un, è un posto piccolino. Eh, e devo dire che con questo Covid sono stati bravissimi, abbiamo lavorato online e guarda, è stato veramente sconvolgente scoprire che puoi fare questo lavoro io, no, io ero contro online mio marito tante volte ha cercato di coinvolgermi ma eh, sono riuscita ad arrivare a questi insegnanti eh, avevano già fatto dei percorsi magari uh, alcuni li hanno fatti con l'Alessandra De Luca alcuni con uno con la Serena Penso, alcuni hanno già fatto dei percorsi, una la sta facendo con la Silvia Bognotti qui a Brescia, quindi eh, c'erano già ehm, delle buone fondamenta quando sono venuti, ma il Full Immersion Online è stato meraviglioso, sono stata contentissima, ho conosciuto dei nuovi insegnanti che veramente saranno forti anche loro. Saranno forti. Grazie a, anche a Ezio. a Ezio. Ezio Franzoni, la, sì. tuo, tuo ma, marito. Ezio. Ezio sì, che insegna tutta la parte armonia per la voce e che fa tutto questo veramente, tu lo sai Eva, no? Che organizza tutte queste cose online, le, le cose che no, io non sono capace a fare. Per fortuna c'è lui che può organizzare tutto questo e ci aiuta. Grazie esatto. Eva per questo, per, per questo, per organizzare questa intervista con me e Anna. This is, thank, grazie mille. Well, you're welcome, Elizabeth. Uh, I guess next week we'll have uh, 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 an interview for Anna, so Anna non dire tutto stasera, tieni qualcosa per settimana prossima che, sì. che ci accorderemo su una data, in linea di massima pensiamo che sarà per martedì, no? Sì, martedì, benissimo. Poi, sì. poi faremo, faremo un, uh, un annuncio su Facebook. Uh, so, so uh, we believe um, Anna's interview will be held on Tuesday, next Tuesday, but we'll make an announcement on Facebook. So, you know, we, we have to decide the, you know, the time and, you know. So, scusa, well, c'è una domanda da, da parte di Elisa Bartalini, che è una nostra insegnante certificata che chiede se Liz può dire due parole, se è possibile, sul il rapporto tra canto eh, lirico e il canto moderno per il VP, con, nel VP. 
Elizabeth, there's a question for you. Okay. There's a question for you. Uh, somebody was asking if you can talk a little, you know, very briefly about my uh, intended um, dire classico opera. Sì, lei dice uh, the are you say compare opera and and uh, I don't know what she says. Vuole un confronto o i punti d'unione? Yes, a comparison. And what do they have? Comparison. Oh, a comparison. Yes. Oh, now, oh, sure, sure. Let me let me say right right now. How much time do I have? Two hours <laughs> or, or two minutes? The line is gonna drop. We don't have much time. Okay, so for example, for example, let's take vibrato, okay? In uh, pop, we have five different vibratos. We have uh, throat, fly me to the moon. That's, I call that throat vibrato. We don't do that in classical, otherwise it would sound like this. No, that would never happen in classical. So this is, um, let me just go through the vibrato. So throat vibrato, then the shimmery vibrato. So throat is fly me to the moon, right in here. Ah, it's an, uh, it's actually the base of the tongue that does it. Fly, it's right in here, fly. And a, a fast vibrato, fast throat vibrato, I call it shimmery. And we use that for scatting and jazz that's shimmery in classical we use shimmery vibrato that's this fast shimmery vibrato in classical and and i said said you use that in scatting but in scatting, you're going to use more nasal. Or unless you're up high. Shimmery is used in both. Um, we have the, the flutter, the vocal cord flutter, which is the Edith Piaf French cabaret, which is like a la vie en rose. <laughs> And really nobody uses that except maybe cabaret French uh, style. Although you can hear it in some, some pop singers. There's a fifth, uh, another vibrato, which is called Mediterranean, which you can hear in uh, Ariana Grande. Um, a lot of the new, newer singers Rihanna uses. It's kind of two notes. Ah, 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 ah. It's like a very Arabic. You have to listen carefully, but you'll hear it. The vibrato that is not taught enough is the diaphragmatic. I call it diaphragmatic vibrato. It's pulsation, pulses from the diaphragm. And that is used in both classical and in pop. So in pop, it would sound like this. Whoa! So there, ah, 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 right from there. Whoa! Whoa! can use diaphragmats for, from the long notes. In classical, we do the same thing, diaphragmatic vibrato. For long notes. Okay, then we have the, that's vibrato. Throat, throat cry we have in uh, pop. Oh, baby, 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 come back to me. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's a feeling of crying in your throat. Desperate need, help, I need you. Oh, oh. get that in a lot of blues music, a lot of R&B, especially. And in classical, we have it as well. Addio, senza rancor. I'm just making up stuff. I'm just making up words. But I mean, <laughs> you know, but I'm. Mean, 
So I'm using my dynamics, my crescendo, loud and soft, loud and soft. And I'm using the throat cry. Without the throat cry, it would sound, Addio, senso rancor. Instead of, Addio, Addio, senso rancor. So you put the throat cry, it's just a feeling of crying in your throat. That's all it is. There's a throat laugh. Ha, ha, ha. My dear Marquis, it seems to me. Oh, ha, 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 ha. You put a laugh in your throat. You can do that with um, pop too. I'm so happy to be here, baby. Oh, one of these days, I'm going to see you and i'm gonna kiss you baby <laughs> and, it's a laugh and, it's, and there's also the sensual the sensual oh there's a creaking creaking door oh i need you baby uh, christine aguilera does that a lot and the need and the sensuality oh turn down the light and hold me tight, oh baby, I need you. That sensuality, and Carmen does it when she says, If she did that without the sensuality in the throat, it would be, No. So you've got to have an emotion in both classical and pop. You do the same thing. Throat cry, throat laugh, sensuality, creaky door. Oh, that feeling of, oh, oh, oh I'm meh, oh, I'm meh. It's a cry. It, it's all, you can't just sing notes in any, in any genre. Whatever kind of music, it's not all about the notes. It's about emotions and, and feeling. And you can't do all of that unless you have your breathing, correct, your support, correct, your vocal colors, which are head, nasal, mouth, chest, colors, you learn that's part of the vocal power method. And all of this are in my products on my website, vocalpoweracademy.com. So all the products, we're separated them out now. You can not only do the toolkit, but you can get them separate. So I want to share everything I can with you. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, Yes, there's one more thing. I call it pop coloratura. And it's singing fast notes, the way we do in, in classical. Use that same technique with whoa, 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 whoa. You know, whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. I'm making stuff up, but you have the agility, which happens in the vocal cords themselves. The ha 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 in classical in pop. And that's just a brief surface um smorgasbord of the comparisons between classical and, and uh non-classical singing. And there there are more, but those are the main ones. Those are the main ones, main differences. <laughs> so thank you, Elizabeth. And I mean, you you said your you know you said how young you are at the beginning of uh, well, of the interview, you. and you've got an amazing voice. I mean, I can. Oh, you sound. <laughs> I'm, you're supposed to lose your voice by 50, 60, 70. I'm, I'm going to be in one year, I'll be 80. So there you go. That's a high. Degree. Yes, that's incredible. May I translate this? Yes. <laughs> sì, allora, certo. di solito non si parla dell'età di una signora, <laughs> però Elizabeth ha appena detto che tra un anno compirà 80 anni e io vorrei veramente farvi notare. La voce, la precisione, <laughs> il sostegno che ha la tecnica, 
e poi va bene, lasciamo perdere come, come persona perché è dinamica, piena di spirito, piena di vita, piena di voglia di vivere, voglia di fare, per cui eh, non so, ecco, io... Uh, you're my role model. <ride> I try to help come modello, voglio andare avanti così nei miei anni. Eh sì. Provo a aiutare tutti. In uh, tutti i genri, jazz, jazz, blues, whatever. That, that's what I want all the vocal power instructors to just get out there and help people sing better. Give them yeah. their dream with love. Yeah. That's it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yes, that should, that should that should really be what you know our our main objective you know to to make people happy achieve their their objectives and uh you know and and do it with love of course this is going on youtube as well right correct yes so so if uh, somebody hasn't had the chance to see it from the very beginning uh this video will will you will be able to find it on youtube and um so we thank anna Gotti so much for being with us yeah, and uh, uh, she will have her interview next week so uh thank we you. will have anna Gotti being interviewed next week and thank you so much elizabeth uh you are so inspiring You're such a great role model for for all of us and uh it's been a great pleasure to have you here and I'm sure you know people will be seeing uh listening to your interview with great interest you 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 spoke about very many things and uh some of the things I didn't know <laughs> some, some of, yeah some of the things that happened were new to me So that was very, very interesting. So we're going to say goodbye hey. to everybody. Vediamo. <laughs> goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Grazie. Stay with me. Stay with me. Don't go away, Anna and uh, Elizabeth. Uh, so we're going to say goodbye to everybody and uh, buona serata a tutti. Grazie per essere stati con noi. Yeah.